Let's take our Bibles and for our scripture portion, let's look together to Galatians chapter 1. This is a very strong chapter written by the Apostle Paul. Of course, the Spirit directing him. We have this inspired word and showing us the importance of never compromising the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in any manner. It says, Paul, an apostle, one sent is what that word means, not of men, neither by man. There's a lot of that sort of thing going on today where schools are trying to put out preachers. In this day and age, it includes men and women. You think about the thousands that are being put through these preacher factories and people being ordained by men, hands of men laid on them to go out and to some kind of ministry. But Paul says that's not how he was an apostle. It says clearly, but by Jesus Christ. Anybody that's never been taught of Christ has no business speaking of Christ. And there again, sadly, many today are going out using his name, but they don't know the true Christ, nor have they been sent by him. Here it's by Jesus Christ and or even God the Father. It shows us that in this matter of the gospel and the glory of Christ, it's a covenant between God the Father and God the Son. It says, who raised him from the dead. We read other portions of scripture where it says, Christ said he gave his life and he takes it up himself. But all of that is just the way of describing that here was the harmony between God the Father and the Son, and the Son having satisfied his Father that when Christ raised from the dead, it was with his Father's authority that he was raised, showing that that salvation that he came to accomplish was indeed fulfilled. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Galatia was not a place, as in a city, but it was a region that today represents what we would know as Turkey, that sort of area of the world. And there were a number of churches, don't think of church buildings, but think of believers gathered together by the grace of God to worship God in Christ. So he says, grace be to you and peace from God the Father. It's obvious that God had already manifested his grace in these, in revealing Christ in them, but here his prayer is that that same grace continue to be with them and that they enjoy the peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ that the Lord Jesus procured for sinners such as they were. So the basis of their acceptance with God, Paul clearly states here, is not for anything in them because grace indicates lack of merit. If someone is gracious to you, it means that it's completely based on their favor. And so it is with any that God has saved. It is grace through the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work. And that's why Paul says that in verse 4. Everything's tied to the death of Christ. All <laughs> spiritual blessings are in him. It says, who gave himself for our sins. Clearly there can be no peace with God unless that sin has been dealt with and the sins of God's children have been put away in his son who gave himself that he might deliver us from this present evil world. In other words, those for whom Christ paid the debt, he calls out from this present evil world, which means they were of this world just as evil. And yet God in his grace, because of the death of Christ, accomplished on their behalf, calls them out. And it says, according to the will of God, even our Father, and means even our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Do you see any part in there where it gives glory to any one of these for having done right and making their decision for Jesus and having walked an aisle or said a prayer? You don't find any of that. This all glory belongs unto God the Father. Amen means so be it. In other words, without addition. And so, he says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Paul had received word that 
some of these places where he'd gone and preached the free grace of God in Christ, now we're beginning to morph into a mixed message of grace and works. Preachers come along saying it's fine, the grace of God gets you started, but now to carry on, you're going to have to provide some personal obedience or follow some ceremony or work, much as the mixed message that you hear today. People use grace. They say, well, we, we believe in God's grace, but at the same time, they believe as much in what they call the responsibility of man, that you've got to, they say, the grace of God gained it, but now you need to maintain it. You can see what Paul calls it here is another gospel one of another kind. That same word, another, was used of those in Romans 1 that turned the grace of God into lasciviousness, pursuing those things which were against nature. What Paul is saying is whatever you come up with that some may call the gospel is anything but the gospel. It's a perverted gospel. That word, another, means it's been perverted. That's the word he uses in verse 7, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And that's a strong word, would. It means they willfully pervert it because they've never been taught of Christ themselves and they, in some small manner, want man to have his part in salvation. That's a perversion of the gospel. And notice, those that preach what they call a balanced message, Heard that over and over again how God's sovereign, but we got to make sure we include man's responsibility. Yes, Christ died, but so anytime they put a but, it's like on a seesaw. You, you got you get on a seesaw with somebody, you got to make sure one goes up and the other goes up, keep it balanced. But here, Paul calls such as do that as troubling you, and you want something to trouble the soul when you're sitting there weighing, well, is it? grace of God, or do I need to also contribute my part? All that can do is trouble the soul. So Paul says in verse 8, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Strong word, let him be damned. That's the way of perdition. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received. In other words, it is not according to this word, let him be accursed. Dare not take any part of this word that gives God all the glory. Glory to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as being all in salvation, and in trying to wedge in man's will, man's way, or man's works. It is a perversion and left in that state, such a one will be damned. The curse. It says, for do I now persuade men or God? Some will look at that and say, well, that's being pretty tough. Oh, you're going to make a lot of enemies. So be it. Am I to persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? I'll tell you this, if in any way a preacher is caught up with the thought of having to please men, no matter what kind of knowledge he has of the truth of God in Christ and salvation by him alone, if he is moved by men, either their smiles or their frowns, their favor or their, their frowns, he can't preach the gospel. He said, for if I yet pleased men, the way he puts it there was there was a time when he sought to please men by bolstering up some sort of self-righteousness that he thought he had. He said, I should not be the servant of Christ, one bowed to Christ, one entirely given to Christ and serving him alone. So he says, I certify you, brother. I certify, you get a certified letter, it means you own it. Once you sign, I certify you, brother, that the gospel which, which preached of me is not after man in any way. This is the part where when this message is preached this way, you, you smoke out the rats. You plug every hole and then here come the, the rats out of that hole. You smoke out all those that hide behind the message of grace and the gospel. 
but yet inside they still think man has his part to play. He says, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the only way that any are going to know Christ as he's revealed the gospel is that Christ himself has revealed himself in that sinner. He said, you heard of my conversation time past in Jews' religion. He's talking about his zeal, but not according to knowledge. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Such was the divide that Paul saw even then that two could not coexist. See, there's preachers today that want to get grace and works to coexist. Even Paul in his unconverted state understood that you could not marry works religion and this message of Christ. And so that's where he set out to persecute and destroy this message of grace. And I'll tell you, if any man today takes such a stand by God's grace, they're going to know the same sort of vehement hatred because it gives no place for man other than being the recipient of God's grace. That salvation is entirely of God in the Lord Jesus Christ when we get in. He said, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion. Oh, how so many today profit in their religion. They write books, they go on tours, they build big, enormous shrines and places of worship. They bring glory to their own name. And he said, I profited above many of my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of my fathers. If he got opportunities to go around and speak, he was the number one speaker. People wanted to hear him. He was exceedingly zealous of the traditions of his fathers. So he said, well, what made the difference? Did Paul sit down one day and start thinking, well, let me, let me logically think through this now. It says in verse 15, when it pleased God. Now notice, who separated me not at the point when he believed, but who separated me from my mother's womb. That's an amazing statement right there that even though all those years he was raised in the Jewish religion, went through the traditions and was taught at the feet of Gamaliel, and yet all the while had been one of God's elect, separated from my mother's womb, but look at in time called me by his grace. I dare say all of us that are here today and listening to this gospel of God's grace, we weren't born believing this gospel. All sinners born in this world are born with self-will. That's the rebellion of this heart against the Holy God. They're going to try to, the word religion actually means to re, it comes from a French word, relier, it means to, to retie. So most people, when they're born, they know that there's been some kind of separation, and so they endeavor to fix that by their works and their will. Paul was in that, and so were we, but when it pleased God, when will a sinner see Christ when it pleases God? And we know that every one that God has chosen, he will indeed call by his grace. That word call means to summon. Read some of these old writers, they like to say invite. God's inviting. And he's not, he's summoning. It's like you get a, a summons from the court. This is a summons from God Himself to come to Christ. And that grace, you know, this verse 16, is by the revelation of Christ to reveal His Son. No, not just to me, but in me. You like to say, well, when was Christ revealed to you? It's like the sun shining on blind people. They know the sun's risen, but they can't see it. When will a sinner see Christ when it pleases God to reveal his son in him? Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's an important point to note. 
that I might preach him among the heathen, among the nations, among the Gentiles. Immediately, I confer not with flesh and blood. That's a strong point because there are people today that hear of this message. And what's the first thing they want to do? Let me go talk to my preacher about this. And I'll tell you, that preacher is going to dissuade them any way they can. They're going to speak ill of whoever preaches and exalts Christ and giving him all the glory. Denouncing man's supposed free will. But Paul said, I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. He didn't even try to cozy up to the apostles to try to get a way in with them. He said, I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But the other of the apostles saw I none save James, the, the Lord's brother. So he wasn't a schmoozer. He wasn't trying to get in on the inner circle here and claim any kind of authority or right with them. He knew himself, as he says in another portion, the least of the least when it came to being an apostle. Born out of due season. So it says, now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. This matter of preaching the gospel is, is vital, even more vital than what you see when they want to take a, a witness and put him under testimony. So they ask him to raise his right hand and Swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. If that's the so in the course of men, how much more important here, where Paul is saying, these things that I write unto behold before God I lie not. There's people today calling God to witness that are blasphemers, but here Paul is calling God to witness. God is my witness. I know I'm a sinner, but in this matter I lie not. And afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. In other words, they'd heard of Paul, but they'd never seen him. They couldn't identify him. They didn't have, like we do today, with photographs and pictures being passed around. If you see this guy, beware. He's a persecutor. No. So as he went from place to place, he was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which are in Christ. They had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches, notice, the faith. Whatever you see justified by faith, it's not by your believing, it's by the declaration of Christ and who he is and what he accomplished in his death, which once I destroyed. I know anybody that today is a preacher of Christ, there's a before Christ and after Christ. And I know even in my own case that I had been raised in a mixed message. It's by grace, but you still have to do your will. That, just that alone, preaching that supposed balanced message was an offense to Christ and his gospel. And more one preaches that way, the more they destroy, they pervert the gospel. But I'll tell you, when it pleases God to reveal Christ to you, all that goes away, which once he destroyed. It says they glorified God in me. That's how you find out who are the Lord's. When you exalt him, declare him, speak of him and his finished work and how God is just to justify upon completion of his work at the cross, plus nothing. His blood is our righteousness and satisfaction before holy God. His righteous obedience is imputed to sinners such as we are. And when that message is clearly set forth, you find out who all they are that the Lord is so taught because they will also glorify God in that. Gracious Father, thank you for your word. I pray that as we continue this time of worship, that already our hearts will have been stirred by your spirit that it is only by your grace that such as we are, are saved. It's because you purposed it and uh, your son completed it, that the spirit now is calling out all those for whom you, your son accomplished this work. So I 
pray for your blessing as we continue to study your word. Lord, take our hearts and tune them by your grace. To sing to your glory and praise alone. For that we give you the honor and glory. In our dear Savior's name I pray. Amen. Amen.